Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited that you came to be with us tonight for our talk on mental health. I'm just uh, looking up real quick. We uh, are, uh, you guys know that mental health and the church, there's always a stigma involving these two things. And the church has a specific ministry to people who struggle with all types of mental health, from depression to uh, clinical diagnoses to just the whole, the whole gamut. And the, our church has really uh, made an effort over a decade probably to reach out to people through grief share and divorce care, celebrate recovery, all different types of ministries. And uh, through COVID, we kind of had a, a little bit of a setback. Ministries that we had growing um, kind of stalled a little bit like, mu like much did um, during that time. So we are working on uh, kind of getting things moving again in the right direction. And we are excited to have Jenna Meister here from Rockwall Heath Counseling to talk with us a little bit about grief and how the church can help with people who are going through traumatic um, experiences in their life. Because we all, uh, there are statistics, and you probably know a lot more of them than I do, but, you know, one in two people will have a mental health event, I think, or this year, so of some, of some type. So uh, we are excited to hear what she has to share with us tonight, and thank you all for being here. This is Jenna. Hello, good evening. Y'all, I'm so excited to be here for, for many reasons. Um, one, because I love this topic, and I think it's so needed in our church across the board, right? And I think that um, we, do, we don't talk about it enough, right? Um, number two, if you can't tell, my voice is a little scratchy. I was fine yesterday. My voice was fine, and I woke up, and my, I felt like I was losing my voice. And something about when I feel like I'm going to step into something for ministry for my mission trip people, this is for you too, Sometimes when you're going into ministry, something will, like, push back. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? And so I felt like I've, all day I felt like something has been pushing back on me and taking my voice. And that makes me excited, y'all, because there's a breakthrough that happens when you do ministry anyway. Right? Does that make sense? So I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm talking about grief. How can the church care for hurting people? Okay, just to take a poll, uh, you mentioned statistics. To take a poll, did anybody uh, live through the, p the pandemic, the recent pandemic? <coughs> anybody here? Yes. So 100% of us have experienced some kind of global trauma that happened with the pandemic and it, in all different various degrees. Um, I would wager that some of you actually lost people that you loved. Maybe. Some of you lost friends. I know for me, I had friends that had very very different political views surrounding COVID. And because I didn't believe the way they did, they decided they didn't want to be my friend anymore. This has divided families and friends, right? So that's the most recent thing, and it's on a global scale, right? But there are many things that can cause grief and pain. So I'll start with what is grief. We'll, we'll start defining grief first, and then we'll go into, okay, so what do we do with it? Does that make sense? Is that okay? Are y'all with me? Okay, I love dialogue. I am a counselor by profession. Um, and so if you have a question or if you need me to clarify or if you don't agree, um, that's fine. Um, you don't have to share it. Um, but if you do agree, I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> All right, but I do want you to talk to me if, if you will. Um, what is grief? Grief is a natural response to death or loss. The grieving process is an opportunity to appropriately, appropriately mourn a loss and then heal. The process is helped when you acknowledge grief, find support, and allow time for grief to work. Now, in my personal belief, there is no better place to grieve than the church. Let me say it again. There is no better place to grieve than in the church. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that would say that's where it was the hardest to grieve because the church doesn't always know what to do with grief, right? So I'm going to go through a, some, a list of things. And if you are bold enough to raise your hand, I'm going to just name off a list. It's not an all-inclusive list. There's no way I could do it. But if I call it out and you've experienced it or you've you're really close to someone who's experienced it. I want you to just kind of wave at me so I can kind of get a feel of what is in this room. Okay? Um, the loss of a close family member or friend to death. Yeah. 
What about by separation? A move, a divorce? Yeah. Um, the process of losing a loved one over time. This is where I'm at. My father is sick, and we are slowly watching his illness take over. Has anybody experienced that? That's hard, right? Because how do you grieve that? Um, the loss of a job. Anybody lose a job? Yeah? Or a position that they thought they should have had? Um, how about anybody lose a pet? That beloved cat or dog or fish or turtle, whatever it might be to you, it matters to you, right? And grief is real when you lose those loved furry babies. Um, how about for my parents in here, has anybody experienced um, a wayward child? Someone who's left home and has decided they don't want to have anything to do with you. There's grief, there's grief that comes with that. Um, how many, one in three women have miscarriages. Anybody? That's me. Yeah. Um, let's see, empty nesters. Do I have any empty nesters? Yeah, there's grief that comes with that, watching your kids grow up and move on. Divorce? Okay. How about retiring? Anybody retired? Yeah. Retiring is, is so funny because it's, it's, it's exciting because you can move into something new, but it can also mean a loss of some sort of identity. And there's grief that comes with that. When you don't feel like you have a purpose, right? What do you do with that? Um, I, I know that there are some, some of my older friends in here, my geriatric, closer to, I know that we're all young in here, but those that might be closer to the geriatric category, right? Losing friends and loved ones over a period of time, just like losing the ability to do things that you've done before, right? Can't go on that jog that you used to be able to do or somebody has to take away your keys because you can't safely drive anymore, right? These are, these are things that cause deep grief for our older community. Um, what about a life-altering injury? Anybody experienced that for themselves or have watched it happen to someone else? Yeah, maybe the loss, the losing the ability to walk or, t or speak, right? These are, these are tragic things that happen and we have to adjust, but it comes with grief. There are five stages of grief. Anybody? Anybody know the five stages of grief? Anger is one. Anybody else? Okay. Denial is one. What? Acceptance. Yes, there's two more. Bargaining, very good. What's the last one? Depression. Depression or numbness, right? Now, the five stages are listed in order. First, there's denial. Oh, my goodness, I've received this information. I know for, let's you just, for the sake of an example, let's use COVID. How many of you started hearing about COVID on the news and you're like, whatever, this is dumb? Right? This is no, in no way. And then when they say, well, you're going to wear a mask, right? For me, and, and, and there are all kinds of different opinions that, that go with this. But for me, I was like, there's no way. I can't do this. And it was different for me because I'm legally deaf. I wear hearing aids and I read lips. So the whole world disappeared when they put a mask on. Grief, because I didn't know when it was going to end. And so suddenly I became invisible and it was not fun, right? So there's all these different experiences that we, and we all experience it differently and we all grieve a little differently. So there's this denial piece that comes with, I know this is gonna change my life, but I'm not ready for it to change my life yet. And so we push it back for as long as possible. There is bargaining, right? I'm in that season right now, right? Cause my father is, is sick. And so for me, it's more of like, okay, if I do this, then this could happen. Or if I do this, then maybe this will change. Or if I could provide this, then maybe we could, whatever. Does that make sense? 
so there's this bargaining piece that happens when you are like on the cusp of losing, right? Or on the cusp of losing a child, right? How, how, what do you do to give and take in order to, to keep that relationship solid and healthy, right? And there's grief that happens when there's a severing and a breaking, right? And then after that is done, then I'm going to add to those five that we have that are like, everybody knows the five stages of grief, but I'm going to add shame. There's a lot of people that struggle with shame. And I, I like to tie it with the bargaining piece, right? Because after we lose somebody that we love, there's always this piece that's like, but I didn't, I didn't do this. I didn't do enough. I didn't say this. Or maybe I said this and I shouldn't have. Or I did this and I shouldn't have. And now I feel ashamed, right? This is a real thing that people in the church are experiencing. And shame, shame itself is a whole different category. We could spend days on the topic of shame and how it divides us and separates us. So it's important to know that it's lingering when you are working with people who are dealing with grief. Depression. Depression is very real. So first, the denial, and then you're going to start bargaining, and then it's like you lose hope because the death actually happened. The loss actually happened, and you had no power or control over that event, whatever it might have been, right? And so it's very common and very natural and normal to kind of go into a season of numbness, right? Like I, uh, not to feel anything. It's easier if I just don't feel anything. And this, actually this can play out differently for many people. Some people will disappear when they're depressed, right? And they get really withdrawn. You know, it's the classic, typical, turn the lights off, I just want to take a nap and sleep until I have to wake up again, I just want to hide, right? But another form of depression is to get really, really busy, right? How many of you have heard in the news or seen on social media a suicide that was so shocking, right? Because that person was so happy all the time, and they did all the fun things, and they hung out with the fun people, and they were always laughing, Right? Now, this is scary because you can't always pick them out of a crowd. But sometimes the people who are the loudest and the happiest and post all the fun things, sometimes they're the ones that are struggling the most when nobody's looking. We need to be aware of that when there's grief in the church. Um, anger. Anger is a fun topic for me because... Anger is never the first emotion, ever. Research and studies show that anger is always secondary. Now, it comes so fast, right? Something happens, trigger happens, and you're angry. It comes really quickly. There's actually two emotions, and I say three, but two emotions that happen first, fear and pain. Fear and pain, right? So if you see a dog, right? And what, ha what do they do when they are afraid? What does a dog do when they're afraid? Huh? Start growling. They try to make themselves bigger. Right? Or when a dog is hurting, they lash out. You get too close, they're going to lash out. This is anger, pain, and fear. Grief hurts. And it comes with this hopelessness piece. Wh what am I going to do now? I'm afraid. Things, w things are changing, and I don't know what's going to happen next. When you deal with people who have grief, especially, especially prolonged grief, you often find angry people. Right? And when you encounter angry people, it is our first instinct to be like, well, you can go be angry somewhere else because I don't want to deal with that. Right? And we take on that offense, or we become defensive, right? When you are dealing with anger, and this is across the board for grieving or not, if you have a spouse that's angry, if you have a sibling who's angry, if you have a friend who's angry, and they're not typically angry people, the question is never, what's wrong with you? What's the matter with you? That should never be your first, answer, first question. The first question is, what are your 
afraid of? What's hurting me? Right? Because it takes that anger and it dissipates it. It disarms anger when you're willing to ask harder questions. Right? Because we don't always know how to put words to the things that hurt us. Or we don't always know how to explain that I'm afraid. Right? So when you ask those questions, it automatically puts us into a place of evaluation, self-evaluation. What's going on inside of me that's causing me to be angry? And I always add shame to that. Shame. I come back to shame because this is something in the church that we deal with all the time. So if you have someone who's angry, another question could be, what are you ashamed of? What has happened that you can't escape from? And that can be a sin that I have committed. It could be a sin that has been committed to me. And as a result of that, I have shame. And it looks a lot like anger. But that ties back into grief that make sense? Yeah? So anger, acceptance, right? So you, you go through all of these things, and then <sighs> it's done, and I'm going to accept it. And this thing that has happened is real. This thing that's happened, can't, I can't go back and change it. But I will live to see another day, and there's hope for a new future, right? How many of you know that when you get to acceptance, it lasts forever. Does it last forever? No. Has anybody been keeping up with the Chosen series? Anybody? I have. I don't, uh, there's all kinds of dialogue on whether it's doctrinally sound or whatever. But they, Dallas Jenkins hits on um, the miscarriage. So in, in the show, Peter, the Apostle Peter and his wife have a miscarriage. And they play it out over several shows, and she is dealing with a lot of pain, and he is dealing with a lot of pain. I have accepted the fact that I have lost three babies, and I'm okay with it. But, man, watching those shows triggered pain in me because I could get it. I got it. I understood it, right? So just because you go through all the the stages of grief doesn't mean that you're not going to get hit out of nowhere. When you least expect it, something will trigger and remind you that there is pain that you have been healed from, but there's still memory that lingers, and we want it to. We don't want that memory to disappear, right, because it becomes who we are. This is part of what God uses to uses to shape us, right, and make us stronger. Okay, so we have all these stages. What does the Bible say about grief? Does anybody have an example they'd like to share? How does the Bible deal with grief? If you want to know some things about me, I'm wild about my husband. I love my kids, and I'm a Bible nerd. Like, to the core, I love the Bible. And so when I talk about topics, I want to know, what does it say? And what does the Bible say? Right? And what you'll see is that Grief starts at the very beginning, right? So when you have Adam and Eve and the fall happen, right, and God comes to them in the cool of the day, right, what what do you see first? Thank you. Say it loud. Shame. Loud and proud shame. Mm -hmm. They were naked, afraid, and ashamed. I can't imagine. Even imagine. And what's the crazy is that God came and He confronted Eve and Adam, but He confronted her and told her that she was going to live very differently from this point on, and it was harsh. It was harsh. What did Adam do after that conversation? Do you guys know? What did Adam do after that conversation? No, no, no. After after the confrontation, yeah, he named her Eve. You know what Eve means? Life giver. So in this moment of intense grief where they were cut off from the presence of God, and God 
who was a friend to them, confronted their sin, right? They were naked and shamed. And Eve, who was the one who took the fruit, carried that. And Adam said, no, no, no. You are the one who will fulfill the promise that God just declared. Because life will come from you. And Jesus will come from you, right? Even though he didn't know Jesus' name, he understood. He understood that something had to happen and it was going to happen through Eve. This is where the church fails. Many times, when we get caught in our sin, and it causes shame, when we get caught up in tragedy, right, the church often will point their fingers, well, if you had done this, then this wouldn't have happened, right? Instead of coming after that tragedy and saying, actually, my friend, there's still hope for a future, and God still has a plan, and it doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. But if we go just a couple sentences later, Eve gave birth. Because when God said, you're gonna, there will be a man that comes from you, right? That salvation will come. Eve gives birth to Cain. And what did she say? His name will be Cain, which means he has come. Did Cain save us? Wayward children? Anybody experience wayward children? Yes. So grief and shame and pain starts the very beginning. We see Genesis is riddled, riddled with pain and shame and grief. Psalm, grief. Job, grief. Ecclesiastes is at the end of Solomon's life. He says, life is meaningless. It's pointless. (laughs) Grief, right? We have lamentation. Lamentation is a beautiful demonstration of grief because it's right after the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. This is a people group that has lost their identity. Lamentation, right? There's a lot of grief in the Bible. Um, we'll go back to wayward children, prodigal son, Luke 15, 11 through 31. There's grief when your children leave. And um, the minor prophets talk about the children of Israel and how they keep leaving the promise and the faithfulness of God. And so God is over and over reminding them, hey, come back. It's way with children and grief. How about career disappointment? There's grief that happens. We take the story of David, for example, in 2 Samuel 7, 5 through 7. God tells him, who's going to build a house for me? Right? He has this conversation with David. He said, you have this house of cedar, but I have never had a house of cedar. cedar. I've just traveled around with all you people in a tent. Where's my house? Right? So David then begins to prepare and get all the materials, and he starts working towards this plan of building this temple. And then you see in 2 Chronicles 28, 2 through 3, God says, actually, David, you can't build the temple for me. Because you're a man of war and you shed too much blood. (sighs) Disappointment. Because God is the one who called him to be a man of war. And then you're denying me this gift because I am a man of war. Disappointment. Grief. Is God still a good God? I need everyone to say yes. Yes. God is still a good God. Right? Is God in control? Yes, he is in control. This is something that the church struggles with when it comes to grief. Is God in control? Yes. Is God good? Yes. How do they go together? When I have tragedy and loss, how is it that God is good? Is he in control? Does he not see? Yes, he does see and he is in control. How can God be a good God if he, why why would he take from me? I begged him not to take from me. And he did it over and over again. Is God still in control and is he still good? Yes. Yes, he is. Right? And so when we're dealing with grief in the church, we have to constantly be reminding our people God is good. God is good and God is in control. Now, you have to be careful with these words when you're dealing with people in grief, with grief, right? And so we'll get to that in a second. 
Um, how do we know? Oh, oh, this is another one. This is good, y'all. What time is it? I did not bring my phone. Are we good on time? Oh, perfect. Okay, you guys, in, let's see, with John 11, the story of Lazarus, he dies, right? And he has, Lazarus has two sisters. Now, these, the two sisters, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, were actually good friends with Jesus, right? As you see in scripture. And Jesus finds out that Lazarus is dead. And does he rush to the party? No. He waits. He waits until Lazarus is not just dead. He is dead, dead. Right? (coughs) Because in Jewish culture, you weren't really dead until after three days because you could revive. Like your body didn't have the medical tools that we have now. Right? Like your body could go into comatose and still come out of it. Right? So it was necessary that Jesus waited as long as he did. But we didn't know that. When we're reading the story, we're like, wow, Jesus, that's harsh. <laughs> and he shows up to the house, and two things happen. Mary and Martha are two very different people. Martha sees Jesus coming, and she runs out to meet him. Where were you? Where were you? Yeah. Mary refused to come out. Where was he? Martha to come out now. Do you see the difference? Most of the time we fall into one or the other, one or the other. They're both incredibly important. So when you're dealing with grief in the church, you're going to have the Marthas that are running and they're demanding answers. I need an answer. Tell me what's going on. Help me understand, right? You're also going to have the Marys in the church who don't know what to say, and they will hide because they don't, they don't know what to do. The church needs to meet both. We need to be there for both, right? The demanding one can be exhausting. The one who's hiding can be exhausting because it's like pulling teeth. Come out. Right? Now Mary comes out eventually and she has the same conversation with Jesus that Martha does. But we have to understand that there's a meeting place that we have to draw people to. That Jesus is always there. Always. Right? Okay. How, what are some signs? This is what I want you to talk. What are some signs that you might be aware of when somebody is grieving or hurting? Some red flags, if you will. Okay. Did y'all hear that? Downcast, spirit is low. Hiding, hiding out. If you notice that somebody's missing, y'all, the church fails on this all the time. If you notice that someone is missing, you need to reach out. A text message, it is so easy to reach out now, y'all. There's Facebook Messenger, there's text messages. You don't even have to get all personal and up close. But reach out. Because they may be hiding because they need to, but they don't know what else to do. Yeah? Anything else? Yeah, exactly. Like if you know, I know that your parent just died, but you're acting like nothing's happened. Yeah? Is grief uncomfortable? When someone comes around you and you know they're grieving, is it uncomfortable? Yeah, it can be. Because I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't want to sound dumb. Right? It can be really awkward. Right? And that makes it even awkward. That makes it even more awkward for the person who's actually grieving because they need someone to see them. They need someone to see them but not try to fix it. Right? Does that make sense? <coughs> um, another sign you might see is someone who is normally like fit and with it. Right? A lot of times when 
people are, are experiencing like deep grief, you'll find that they're confused and they're not quite able to remember details and things are like, uh, they'll miss appointments or they're late or it just seems cloudy, right? So that's another sign if somebody's like, oh, what's going on with you? What's happening? Ask questions, right? Um, okay, so what do we do with hurting people? Let's start with the do not list. Are y'all okay with that? All right, there's, there's a lot of do nots. Y'all ready to take notes? <laughs> All right. Oh, y'all, there's a, there's a ladybug in my book. How cute is that? Oh, did it fly away? Okay. Okay. When someone is grieving, do not, let me repeat, do not make it about you. For the love of mankind, y'all. If someone says, I lost a parent, or I lost a child, or whatever, I lost a job, and your response is, yeah, I remember when that happened to me. Yeah, and you just go into this whole story. <sighs> the person who's grieving does not care about your story. They just don't. Give it a little time, please, right? Where you can swap stories, right? Now, it is okay to say, man, I have experienced some things like that. How can I serve you? How can I see you better? How can I love you well in this season? Right? When you're ready, my friend, let's share this over a cup of coffee. I want to hear your details. And if you want to hear my story, I've got it. But in no way is my story going to be a one-up when someone's in tragedy. Right? It's a big no-no. Don't do it. It'll make people run. Um, all the cliche sayings. Anybody got a cliche saying that you want to throw out? Huh? It'll all be okay. Everything's fine. Is it though? The person who's grieving. Is it okay? Because I don't feel like it's okay. Just breathe. Right? It's good. I'm good advice. Just breathe. What about some cliche things? Yes, I hate that one. Does God need you in heaven? No, he does not. All right, please don't say that to somebody who just lost a child or a parent or a loved one. Well, God just must have needed them more in heaven than they needed them here for the love. It hurts. That means God cares didn't care about me, what I need. I needed them here. I needed that relationship. What about God won't give you anything you can't handle? Is that biblical? No. Nowhere in the Bible will you hear or see God will not give you anything you cannot handle. In fact, it's the opposite over and over and over again. People are broken all through the Bible, and there is nothing left until God steps in, right? He will bring us to pieces sometimes, or life itself will bring us to pieces sometimes. But it's in those moments when we're able to lift up our eyes to heaven and say, I don't have it. I don't got it, God. I'm losing it. I, don't, I can't handle this. This is not something I can handle. When I lost my baby and someone said, God won't give you anything you can't handle. You can handle this. No. No, I couldn't. I could not handle it. So when you talk to someone who's grieving, right, don't say that. Acknowledge the pain. And be okay with it. We say things like this because we're uncomfortable and we don't know what else to say. Oh, we're trying to fill the silence, right? Because silence can be really uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> I was just about to say that. Time heals all wounds. Yes, we know that as time goes by, things get easier. But I want to know, what do I do right now? Right? When I've lost my job... And I have nothing coming in. 
and I've got a family to provide for, I feel cheated, I feel wronged, I need an answer right now. Right? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. God will provide a way. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. But sometimes when someone is going through tragedy, it's okay to stop and be still and say, you know what, this is awful. This is awful, and I see you here. I see you here. Okay, things that we can do. Number one, what can you do? First, first answer. Think Christian answer. Pray, 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 right? Be in conversation with the God who knows and sees and hears and understands, right? Because he is not uncomfortable with silence. We are. Okay? So pray before you meet with someone. Pray before you confront someone. You can be praying. If you see that person and they're walking in and you know they just lost a loved one to death or they just lost a job or something tragic has had their house burned down, whatever it may be, as they're walking down the hall, in your head, be, God, I need your words. Should I say anything or should I just hug them? Right now, I don't recommend you just hug people. Always ask. I grew up in Texas, and I always hug, I used to hug people all the time without asking. But then I moved to Chicago for five years, and I've learned that people actually really want to be asked. Not everybody wants to be touched. But if you ask more often than not, people say, yeah. Right? And it can be healing. But if you rush up to someone and you grab them and hug them, and they don't want it, it's the opposite of healing. Right? That was free. That was not in my notes. <coughs> um, acknowledge the pain. This is a, on the to-do list. Acknowledge the pain. It is okay to say, I see you hurting. I see you hurting. I see you there. I know this sucks so bad. Right? It's okay to, to acknowledge the pain. What we try to do because it's uncomfortable is we try to wipe it away, wash it out. Oh, it's all okay. Let's, you know, and we try to make them laugh, which is good. We want to do that. But first, acknowledge that your friend is in pain. Right? Ask them if you can pray with them. And if they say, no, not right now, that's okay. All right, well, let's go get a cup of coffee. What do we want to talk about? And it can be something completely opposite or different, right? And that's okay, right? But acknowledging the pain and asking your people, what do you need from me? And they may not have an answer, right? And if they don't have answers, that's okay. But you might be surprised, you know? You might be surprised. For me, I just needed somebody to be in the same room with me. That's all. I don't want to talk to anybody, but I don't want to be alone either. I don't want you to try to fix it, but it's really nice that you're present, right? I'm a coffee lover. I drink coffee from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. And I had this friend that would literally leave coffee for me on my, on my doorstep. She wouldn't even tell me she was coming by. She would just take a picture of it on my doorstep and send it to me. And by the time I got to the coffee, she was gone. Right? That was loving care for me. I needed that. Right? So find creative ways to serve your people. Take them a meal. Right? Bring coffee. Send flowers. All of those things are wonderful, but it doesn't even have to be that. It can be a note that just says, I love you, and I see you there, and I'm here. I'm present with you. Right? Um, let's see. In, okay, this is important for, the, for people. Encourage slow, methodical decision-making. What happens is when we're in tragedy or in grief or loss, we tend to try to make decisions like this, right? I have a dear friend who passed away a couple years ago, and her husband literally two days later gave away all of her stuff, every piece of jewelry, every single piece of clothing item, every little trinket she had in the house. He was so devastated by her loss that he didn't want to be reminded of her at all, anywhere he looked. And he did it so fast that nobody had a chance to even step in, right? A year later, oh, man, that, that's terrible. 
And he looks back now and he's, he wishes that somebody would have said, you know what, take your time. Put it in a box if you need to and put it away. But hold on to it for a little while just in case, right? And this can happen with death and loss, but it can also happen with um, any other kind of tragedies. Just because you lost this job doesn't mean the very next thing is the right one, right? Um, and but and that's no that's no laughing matter because if you ha- need to provide for a family, it can be really hard to take your time, right? But be present with people and pray, right? Ask that the Prince of Peace would be present, right? That we wouldn't operate out of panic or fear, right? Encourage lament. Lament. The church has lost the meaning of lamenting, right? Lamenting is the conduit, the conduit of our prayer and our pain to the heart of the Father, right? So many of the Psalms, the book of Lamentation, it's literally a cr- an outcry to the Lord, but it turns into prayer, right? Teach your children, teach your family, teach your church how to pray through lamentations, right? How to grieve through lamentations. When David was, was crying out to God in pain, he turned it into, God, you are so good. Lord, there is none like you. God, you are the only one that can hang the stars in their place. You're the only one that can do this or that or this. But God, I have my, the enemy that's surrounding me at every place, everywhere I look, I'm being attacked do you hear the pain? Do you hear, do you hear it? I've, I've lost God. Where are you? He said that over and over in Psalm. God, where are you? Will you ever hear me again? Will you ever acknowledge me again? Right? So we hear this over and over again in the Bible, and, and it's turning grief, it's turning pain into prayer. Right? So my mom and dad are, are <clears throat> putting a new house up, and I watch. Um, the electrician come out and they had to like trench a hole. This is all new to me. I didn't, I, I don't know how any of this stuff works. But they, they dug a trench and then there were these pipe things that they had to put in a hole, right, all connected from the, the power source to the house, right? And then they put the dirt over it. And I'm like, great, we have electricity now. <laughs> nope. Now they take the necessary wire, the whatever it is that they need, and they pull pull it through the, <laughs> they pull it through the pipes and they connect it. That seems so complicated to me, but it's, it's the way that it works, right? And it was interesting to me because it really struck a chord. I knew I was speaking today. Lamentation is just like that. It's a conduit that we can't necessarily see, but as we cry out to the, to the Lord, we're connecting to the heart of the Father, and he's the power source from which all things come, Right? So it's easy for us to pick up the phone and vent and be angry. What kind of God would do this? You know, all the things. Also, um, I forgot to say on the do not list, do not celebrate pain of other people through gossip. Don't use, oh, would you pray for sister so-and-so? Because they just, their husband just left. Right? Right? Instead, instead, will you pray for Sister jo- So-and-so? Her life is falling apart, and I just want to step in the gap for her. Will you do that with me? Yeah. Don't celebrate people's pain because you know the details that other people don't know. People who are grieving need you to protect them. Okay? People need you to protect them. The church needs to step up to the plate. And we're not always real good at it. Okay. Um, Okay, so one more thing, and then we'll open up for question and answers if we have time. Okay. Um, One more thing. Ask hard questions. So if you know someone is depressed or dealing with some kind of tragedy in their life, husband has left, wife has left, um, lost a job, lost a loved one, some kind of separation has happened, a loss of identity, right? I've lost a job. I don't know who I am anymore. When these things happen, it can send us into a place of depression, which is part of the five stages of grief, right? It is okay to ask hard questions. It is a myth. It is a myth. It is not real. When you ask someone, are you suicidal? 
it will not make them suicidal. It will not. But people are afraid. If I ask them, are you, do you have any kind of suicidal thoughts right now? We're afraid that that will, like, plant some kind of seed in their head. Like, all of a sudden, they're not going to want to live anymore. That's, that's just that's not real. Um, <clears throat> but if you see somebody who's really dark, something's really dark happening, ask questions like, do you have hope? Really feel them out. Is there hopelessness happening here? Do you feel like life is, w- is worth living? Right? I have many clients who have lost loved ones to suicide because nobody ever asked the hard questions. And it's tragedy that can often, often be avoided. But we as a church have to step up and say, enough is enough. I'm going to ask the hard questions. I'm going to be here when my people are hurting. Right? Now, tragedy happens to all of us. And community is wonderful. It's beautiful. And sometimes that's all we need is just to link arms with people that love us, especially in the church, right? There are times, though, my friends, when professional counseling is most needed, right? So if you know someone who needs counseling, right, it's okay to encourage them. There, it, like you said, uh, Kate, earlier, there's this weird stigma, and it's actually getting a lot better. That's one of the silver linings of the pandemic is people are coming out of that realizing that mental health is actually a real thing, and we need help, right? And there's not enough people to help. We don't have enough professionals to help. But research, this is so cool, y'all. Research has come out recently. You can Google it if you want to, my Google friend. Google it. Research has come out that lay pastor counseling is just as effective as professional professional counseling. Good pastoral care is just as effective as professional counseling, right? So if your person is not able to go to professional counseling, if there's a finance problem or, or they just need a little help to get there, man, step in with that pastoral care. Love on them, counsel them. Ask them. Counseling is more about listening than it is talking. So if you can get that, you're good to go. But if you feel like you have to fill silence, you're not a good counselor. Stop talking. Okay. All right. Was that good? Yeah? Did anybody get anything new? Anybody? No? Yeah? (laughs) Okay, good. All right, anybody have questions? I would love to answer any questions that you guys have for tonight. Yeah. Uh, years ago, some years ago, I had a pastor that passed away with cancer after the whole church had prayed for him and and really invested, you know, our whole church in the process of standing with them for healing. And I think I'm just now starting to come out of almost a faith failure. How do you help people that you know in your, after after they lose somebody like that, that may be feeling disappointed, just like Martha and Mary? You know, they actually tried to shame Jesus you'd been there you should have been there you should have been there so how do you what's the best way to help that so the question is uh, your pastor passed away and you feel disappointed because God didn't answer your question or your prayer God didn't answer your prayers has anybody been there God did not answer my prayer right that's a hard one because it would mean that I would have to know all the mysteries of heaven and I don't There are questions that we're going to ask of the Lord that we don't have answers for. But that goes back to the sovereignty of God. First, first I'll go there. Is God good? Yes. Is God in control? Yes. Now we're going to wrestle with that when it comes to tragedy and loss, especially if you've cried out God. And we believe him to be a healer. We do. We believe that God can heal. Signs, miracles, and wonders are still happening today, right? And we believe that he's able, and we cry out to God for healing and for answers. 
And sometimes his answer is not what we want. And so I think in those moments, and, and in your situation, the whole church experienced loss of a pastor after crying out to God for, for healing, right? So now you have a whole lump group of people that are grieving together. That's hard. In that case, I would have, and if, you know, if I had been there at that time, I would have said, okay, what kind of professional help? What, what, what about some other churches in the local area? Who can we have come in? and minister to our people because we're hurting. We're hurting and we don't know what to do next, right? And when, it, when things like that happen, the, the, it's like a recipe for division, right? And so when you have a lump of people like that, a group of people like that, in order to avoid division because of pain, fear, shame, anger, all of those things, we, we need to be surrounding those people, right? reaching out to churches, reaching out to counselors, how can we step in and help? Does that help answer at all? Anybody else? Yeah, Janice? You got a microphone coming. Um, are, is there a, other than just hugging people, now I know with permission, um, my, my brother committed suicide and people would at church would go to other sides of the hall and my mother died of cancer six months later and I got so loved on and showered with every imaginable gift of love but that that's a hard one what, what do you okay so that goes back to the uncomfortable piece when something is uncomfortable it is important right um, one of my favorite biblical mentors, Dr. Michael Heiser, he actually passed away a few days ago. But he would, when he would read the Bible, he would say, listen, if it's weird, it's important. Don't just pass over weird passages in the Bible. Does anybody, has anybody ever read a weird passage in the Bible? Yes, it's all over the place, right? If it's weird, it's important. If it's uncomfortable, it's important. There is this nasty stigma about suicide, Right? And, and we don't know what to feel about suicide when it happens. We don't know how to, we wrestle with that, right? We try to place blame, right? The, the truth is, is that we don't have a solid answer all the time. And the truth is, is that there's a family that's left behind that needs just as much care as the family who lost someone to cancer or some other thing, right? So suicide, because suicide, the topic of suicide is so uncomfortable, Right? Because of that stigma, then all of a sudden people who are experiencing that over here, they don't get the love and care that they need because we can't, we can't seem to sort it out over here first. Right? Suicide is loss. That's what it is. It's loss. And it's painful loss. And it's loss that we can't understand. We can't understand it. And all my Baptist people, I love you so much. But there's that question of, were they saved? They couldn't have been saved. There's no way they could be saved if they were healed. I mean, if they committed suicide. It's a question that many believers, we, we wrestle with that. Right? Why is that? That's a good question. Why is that? Mm-hmm. He did. said, I am the only one that knows a man's heart. He, do, he is, and that would be an answer I would give. God is the only one that saves. He's the only one that saves, but man, we try, and I say Baptist because I love Baptist, because we Baptist, I, my, my grandfather was a Baptist reverend for as long as I can remember, and he knew how to disciple people. It was so good, right? The question of salvation was never an issue for him, Right? Um, and he was really good at explaining it and making it so simple to people. But salvation was always in the hands of the Father and not in our hands, ever. It is not my call to make, right? And so when we have someone who lost a loved one to suicide, the first thing we need to be doing is, okay, I see you there. I'm going to bridge the gap in the hall. I'm going to come to your side. 
can I hug you, Janice? That's what I would say. Can I hug you, my friend? Her answer would have been yes. And my first thing would be, how can I be more present for you? How can I see you where you're at? Do you need to talk to someone? Right? And if I don't have the time for that, like if, if like li- realistically, if you don't have time to sit, sit down with someone, don't offer it. Right? Like if you're busy, don't offer it. But there's, there's different ways to, com- to communicate and connect with people. Right? Can I call you when I'm on my way to work tomorrow? I just want to check in on you. Right? There's all kinds of ways. You can be creative on how you connect with people and love them and serve them well. Right? Send them a, a quick text before they go to bed. Because someone who loses someone from suicide especially is super, it, it, there's a confusion that comes with that and it's hard to sleep. You lose a lot of sleep. So it's okay to send a text late at night. Are you sleeping? Can I pray for rest? Right? Did that help at all? Did that help at all, Janice? Yes. Yes, exactly. Did it work? How did that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. or even thought. Go ahead, Janice. Yeah. 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 That's a great way to be pe- present with people. Great way to be present with people. And, and after my second miscarriage, my cousin actually sent me this song, uh, Hills and Valleys by, oh gosh, Taryn Williams, is that his name? Oh my word, I listened to that song over and over and over and over again. That was so healing for me, right? Because I knew that God saw me on the mountain and he saw me in the valley and it was okay because God was with me. And that was good. That was good healing for me. So that's a good point. Thank you. All right. Miss K, am I good on time? All right. Thank you guys so much for letting me come and share. Um, We do have an office in Kaufman. So if you or anyone you know needs professional counseling, please do not be afraid to reach out. Higher Hopes is is in Kaufman right down the road. We serve at the Genesis Center, and we have offices there where we meet with the general Kaufman area population. We also serve women and children in crisis at the Genesis Center. So please call Higher Hopes Counseling. Um, You can look it up online as well. We would love to have you. Okay, and we have a list of resources available um, on the at outside by the welcome wall, there are metal stands on each end, and they have a list of counseling resources. Uh, Higher Hopes is on there. Rockwall Heath, I think, is also on there. So if you need their contact information, as well as some other resources for different specific things that might pertain to you or your family, that resource list is available, and we update that as we get new recommendations and kind of run into new people. So you guys feel free to check that out. You're also uh, welcome to call the church office anytime you need a referral for counseling or just some uh, counseling from your church staff. I think sometimes the biggest struggle as a church staff leader or even as as a church for the people in this room, sometimes people come to church and they expect to be able to get all the answers. What are all the answers to my grief and to my pain and why did this happen to me and why did so and so do that? And I think it's okay to say, I don't have an answer. I don't know all the answers but I love you and I'll sit with you in it. And I'm sorry for what you're going through. So that has been, that has been a thing for me a lot to say, if, you know, for Janice, I, I don't personally know anyone who's taken their own life. No one close to me has, but gosh, I will just, uh, you know, I had a friend tell me one time, 
her her brother died unexpectedly in a car accident and she was like this other girl this other lady she said the best thing that she could do for me she came to my house and she held me in the bed while I cried and that to that to her meant more than anything else so um, just really the ministry of presence is a big one when and, and and it's okay to say I don't have all the answers I don't know why this is happening to you but I'll hold your hand and I'll love you so uh, just take that with you a little bit as you go as well uh, we are again thankful to Jenna for being here I think Jenna for being here she says her name is Jenna or Jennifer she'll respond to either one so uh, it, we are going to have the mission gang come down here and meet with Callie here in just a minute. I'll pray for our dismissal. Thank you all for coming. You guys have been great. Father, uh, we are thankful 